Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Israel has been in the news a lot the last few months. Well, that's not new. Israel has been in the news a lot these last few decades. In 1948, Israel was reborn as a nation. And the day that that happened, when the United Nations had their vote, Israel was attacked. The fighting has continued and the divisions have continued. And we want to take a look at what God has to say about this land. You see, God gave this land to the Jew and has been controversial ever since. And I'd like to take a look at the promises in the Bible. My father produced a great film back in the 1970s called His Land. Cliff Richard, Cliff Barrows narrate this and do much of the work in it. And I would like to give you the opportunity to hear these prophecies from the scripture and, and give you the reason why the state of Israel is so important and what the future holds for the state of Israel. So watch, learn, and listen. And we'll pray that God will use this great film to touch your heart. You know what really impresses me about Israel? It's that, well, God really has a long memory. I mean, he just doesn't forget. Whatever he promised in the Bible, no matter when, it's either happened, is happening right now, or you can be sure that it will happen. And yet there's this idea around that the Bible is a dead book, ancient history, that it's all been worked out from Genesis to Revelation. You know, I have friends who are always saying, if God is God, why doesn't he show himself? You know, let people know that he's still interested in the world. They should come here with a Bible and an open mind. Cliff, remember the uproar on November 29th, 1947, when the UN finally voted to declare Israel a new nation? Yeah, well, not really. I was only seven at the time. <laughs> well, I sure do. And people all over the world who knew what the Bible had to say suddenly realized that we had closed a gap of thousands of years on God's calendar. I'll bet Ezekiel was shouting, Hallelujah. Well, if he did, he sure had company. Jeremiah lived 50 years before Ezekiel, and the Lord gave the same promise to him. Try the 16th chapter of Jeremiah, let's see, around verse 14. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, for I will bring them back to their own land which I gave to their fathers. You know, we can go back further than that. Almost a hundred years before Jeremiah, the Lord gave his plan to Isaiah. That would be 750 years before Christ. Mm. Let me show you. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant which is left of his people. He will raise an ensign for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. They came all right. Hundreds of thousands of Jews from over 100 countries of the world since May 15, 1948. Never before in history has any nation been restored to its original homeland and picked up its original language after nearly 20 centuries of separation. Less than 100 years ago, not one person in the world spoke Biblical Hebrew as a first language. Linguistic experts said that it just could not be done. No one has ever successfully revived an ancient tongue. Today, if the prophet Zephaniah walked these streets of Tel Aviv, he could sit here in this cafe and order lunch without a fumble. Of course, he may have trouble with this pastrami on rye, but he'd recover and without too much difficulty because the Lord told him this would happen over 2,500 years ago. The Old Testament, book of Zephaniah, chapter 3. And at that time, 
I will change the speech of my returning people to pure Hebrew so that all can worship the Lord together. Yes, God promised it, and he is delivering on that promise in his lamb. Yes, it is his lamb, all of it his. He stepped it off and marked it there. Stepped it off and marked it there. To be his earthly thoroughfare. To be his earthly thoroughfare. And then he blessed Stop. it with his hand. Yes, it's a great land. All of it is. And as it blooms before our eyes. As it blooms before our eyes. Just like an Eden paradise. Like an Eden paradise. The world will. To the homeland their fathers were from. Israel, their citadel, Israel, their home. Now they are here at last, never to roam. Here they will stay and bring life to the land. Someday, and with boldness they walk Tall and so straight, see them stand Yes, it is his land, all of it his He stepped it off and marked it there Stepped it off and marked it there To be his earthly thoroughfare To be his earthly thoroughfare he blessed it with his hand. Yes, it's a great land. All of it is. And as it blooms before our eyes, as it blooms before our eyes, like an Eden paradise, like an Eden paradise, the world will understand. You know, miracles happen to people. That's what really makes them miracles. And in looking at Israel today, it's difficult to completely understand what has happened here in such a brief span of years. You see, the people of Israel returned to the land of milk and honey and found it starved by centuries of neglect. Stripped of its forests, the once rich Judean hill country was a wasteland. The fertile valleys of Galilee festering swamps. It's as if this small part of the earth, the parched desert, the rocky wilderness, waited for its people, saving its last promise of beauty for the people of the land. Since 1949, 100 million trees have been added to enrich the earth. Whole mountains now wear shades of green as they did centuries ago. Israel has become one of the six countries in the world producing enough food for its own population. There is hardly a fruit or a vegetable that you won't find growing in some obscure corner of this tiny country. It's pretty glib to make a statement like that. But this miracle of restoration came only after tremendous struggle, trial, and conflict. Conserving every drop of water was just one of the gigantic problems Israel faced at the start. This was the Hula Valley in 1948, a massive, malaria-ridden marsh, half lake, half swamp. 
For centuries, precious water feeding the sources of the Jordan had been squandered here, creating a subtropical wilderness. It took seven years of persistent labor to redirect the water and turn all that black mud into 15,000 acres of usable farmland. In just a moment, you'll see the Hula Valley as it is today. Perhaps you have to be a Jew to really understand that work is a form of prayer when you are home. Just look around and see another of Ezekiel's prophecies fulfilled. And this land that is desolate shall be tilled. And they shall say, this land that was desolate has become like a garden of Eden. Rich fertile valleys of russet and gold. Carpets of green over mountains unfold. Harvest of plenty so joyous and bright. Earth yields her treasures magnificent sight. This is the Israel promise of old. This is the miracle happening now by sages and prophets foretold yes it is his land all of it is he stepped it off and marked it there to be his earthly thoroughfare and then he blessed it with his hand Yes, it's a great land, all of it is, and as it blooms before our eyes, like an Eden paradise, the world will understand. This is Beersheba. You'll find it first mentioned in the Bible in the 21st chapter of the book of Genesis. Abraham dug a well here 4,000 years ago. And beside that well, he made a pledge of peace with the Philistine king Abimelech. This was Philistine country then, and Abraham wanted to graze his flocks in peace. That's how the city got its name, for Beersheba literally means the well of the pledge. Isaac and Jacob also pastured their flocks here. Yes, in many respects, this is still Genesis country. One day out of seven, the Bedouin nomads drift into Beersheba for the camel market. Moving with the effortless grace of royalty, their strong features burn black by the desert sun. They seem cool indifferent to the fact that they have become one of Israel's tourist attractions. Bargaining is a ritual among these proud sons of the desert. The smallest gesture, the flicker of an eyelid, can close a sale. Somehow the endless complaining of the camels, the haggling sounds of the market, the flowing robes, the veiled women, it all seems a conspiracy to defeat time pulling us back to the days of the patriarchs when Abraham pitched his tents here and was favored by God. You can always count on a camel to jar you back to the present. Today, Beersheba is Israel's Dodge City, a frontier town of 80,000 people that is well on its way to becoming a metropolis. Folks in these parts don't have much to say for those softies in Tel Aviv. They believe that Israel's future begins right here on the edge of the desert. We've seen how the countryside of the north has again become a land of milk and honey. The southern half of Israel takes off from here at Beersheba. 
an inferno of sand and sun stretching to the shores of the Red Sea. Abraham would still feel at home out there. Time is a stranger in the desert. Here, the rhythms of life span the centuries. For these nomadic tribesmen are descendants of Ishmael, the wild son of Hagar. And they wander through the sun-scorched wilderness, fiercely guarding their independence. Having worked these grazing grounds for centuries, they see no reason to leave now just because Israel is in possession. Stop by any well in the Negev and you'll see Bedouins. They come daily to water their flocks and exchange the latest gossip. Of course, instead of drawing water, it more than likely comes out of a pipe, and today they manage barrels full instead of clay pots. But that's about all that has changed in thousands of years. Like their forefathers, they live in close alliance with the desert, always in search of meager grazing for their flocks. The animals, in turn, provide basic food and shelter. Black goat hair tents dot the desert around Beersheba, and when the sun heats up the horizon, they become shimmering silhouettes against that tawny landscape. Israel is a small country, half the size of the state of Maine, and you could put it all in Lake Erie and still have water to spare. Fifty-five percent of the land is arid wilderness, and when you're that small, you just can't afford to give up half of anything even if it is all sand and rock. And three inches of rainfall makes it a good year. In a country that is built on impossibilities, reclaiming the desert has become one of Israel's prime objectives. It all begins with water, and Israelis are bringing it from the Sea of Galilee, 90 miles to the north. A gigantic pipeline now straddles the desert. It took four years of careful engineering, dogged tenacity, more than a little sweat, and $100 million to wash the steaming sand of the Negev. If Israel never wasted a drop of its limited water supply, it would still only be able to irrigate half of the land possible. But you start. You begin. The Old Testament prophecies regarding the restoration of Israel are all tied up with the land. As though the Lord meant to proclaim the great mystery of his involvement with Israel in very down-to-earth terms. For the next few moments, the words belong to Isaiah. They have been around for at least 2,600 years. The scenes could have been filmed yesterday or tomorrow. O oh Israel, you are mine, my chosen ones, for you are Abraham's family, and he was my friend. For I am going to do a brand new thing. I will make a road through the wilderness of the world for my people to go home and create rivers for them in the desert. Yes, springs in the desert so that my people, my chosen ones, can be refreshed. I will open up rivers for them on bare heights. I will give them fountains of water in the valleys. In the deserts will be pools of water, and rivers fed by spring shall flow across the dry, parched ground. I will plant trees, cedar, myrtle, olive trees, the cypress, fir, and pine on barren land. Everyone will see this miracle and understand that it is God who did it, Israel's Holy One. The deserts will become as green as the Lebanon mountains, as lovely as Mount Carmel's pastures and Sharon's meadows, for the Lord will display his glory there.
even the wilderness and desert will rejoice in those days. The desert will blossom with flowers. Search the book of the Lord and see all that he will do. Not one detail will he miss, for the Lord has said it and his spirit will make it all come true. Yes, it is his land, all of it his. He stepped it off and marked it there. Stepped it off and marked it there. To be his earthly thoroughfare. To be his earthly thoroughfare. And then he blessed it with his hand. Yes, it's a great land, all of it is. And as it blooms before our eyes, as it blooms before our eyes, just like an Eden paradise, like an Eden paradise, the world will understand. The Old Testament psalmist sang, High on his holy mountain stands Jerusalem, the city of God, the city he loves more than any other. O city of God, what wondrous tales are told of you. Jerusalem has always lived two lives, earthly and spiritual. And these have been going along together for thousands of years. No city in the world can match Jerusalem's history for blood and fire. The armies of the world have clamored against her walls. Jerusalem has suffered countless burnings and endless destruction. And yet each time the city was reborn. Rivers keep pouring life into some cities, or perhaps they have some other geographical advantage. But humanly speaking, here on this remote mountainside, Jerusalem has had every reason to die. In those dark hours when it seemed that Jerusalem would do just that, her spiritual life always took over, sustaining a heartbeat. No, you just can't explain this city apart from God. You'll find the reason in the 14th chapter of the first book of Kings, where God says, Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. In the time of Christ, this was probably the most beautiful city in the world. The rabbis used to say, he will be a wiser man who breathes the air of Jerusalem. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. It's a feeling. There's a presence. The stones seem to radiate it. Just seems to hang in the air. Jerusalem has always been a promise of God's covenant that he's not through with man. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, It's like going through someone's house when he isn't home. You know you've been invited, but the host just isn't there yet. 
like there's always more going on than what you can see. Swords and prayers have clashed here since the days of David. The past is everywhere. And yet you sense the future is always there in the shadows, just waiting for the moment to press in. This is perhaps the most significant ground in Jerusalem. The temple built by Herod stood on this great square. Remember when our Lord was here, he cried out in this very place, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And his invitation to a thirsty world is as imperative in our day as it was when he called to the seeking worshipers in this temple area long ago. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, I will give him rivers of living water. Hey, wasn't it around here somewhere that the, uh, the woman accused of adultery was dragged up before Jesus? It did happen, right here on the temple area. What a reminder that was of Christ's mission in the world, that he came to save sinners, not to condemn them. You know, for me, this is the least confusing part of the whole city, because it hasn't been built up again and again. I mean, this ground level is essentially unchanged since the time of Christ. Herod started building the temple 20 years before Christ was born. And every time that Jesus came here, he must have seen the workmen still adding to its glory. Of course, Mary and Joseph first brought Jesus here when he was just a baby, and then again when he was 12. Of course, it must have been somewhere around here that he chased off those money changers. On Tuesday of that final Holy Week, when Jesus was leaving the temple for the last time with his disciples, they began to boast about the beautiful stonework and all of the decorations on the temple walls. And this is what Jesus said to them. The time shall come when these things you are admiring will be knocked down, and not one stone will be left on top of another. All will be one vast heap of rubble. Master, they exclaimed, when? And will there be any warning ahead of time? Jesus answered, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that the time of its destruction has arrived. For there will be great distress upon this nation and wrath upon this people. They will be brutally killed by enemy weapons and sent away as exiles and captives to all the nations of the world and Jerusalem shall be conquered and trampled down by the Gentiles. Less than 40 years after Jesus said that, the Roman armies covered these hills. The battle for Jerusalem lasted four incredible years. That's how long it took for the Roman legions to completely capture this city. Smoke went up from the high altar for the temple's final sacrifice on July 17, 70 A.D. On that day, the final destruction began. And Jews, fortunate enough to survive, scattered like seed in the wind. It was one of history's bloodiest battles. And it went exactly as Christ said it would. There's more. And Jerusalem shall be conquered and trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of Gentile triumph ends in God's good time. The first part of Christ's prophecy regarding Jerusalem was definitely fulfilled 1900 years ago. It's in all the history books. June 7, 1967, 
may have just taken care of the rest. During those first 19 years of its rebirth, Israel was separated from the heart of its faith by a barrier of barbed wire and bullets. Old Jerusalem, the city of the prophets, was beyond reach, beyond knowing. When their enemies moved against them in an open act of war, the Jews searched for their destiny in David's city. When the Romans destroyed this city in 70 AD, they left one section of the temple wall standing as a monument to their great victory. Most of the young men fighting for Jerusalem that morning had never seen those ancient stones. For 19 years, no Jew had been allowed to even glimpse their majesty. Now the wall was in everyone's thoughts, and they raced to find it. clearly reveals that God has a plan for the world and that the Middle East is God's timepiece for that plan. Jerusalem reclaimed after nearly 2,000 years could well mean that we are nearing the end of a definite block of time on God's calendar and that the world has moved a step closer toward the climactic events that will end this age. When Christ clearly predicted the destruction of this city under the armies of Rome, he also indicated the Gentile domination of the world would come to an end one day, and that this change in world affairs would begin here, in Jerusalem. This much is certain, except for a very brief period of time. Jerusalem has not been completely under Jewish control since Nebuchadnezzar came here with his army. And that takes us back to Ezekiel's day, 2,500 years ago. And today, these stones, which Christ undoubtedly passed many times, again echo praise to God on the eve of the Sabbath, as they did when he worshiped here in Jerusalem. <laughs> The Sabbath begins promptly at sundown, and when the old city takes on a golden hue in the late afternoon sunlight, the ultra-Orthodox Jews hurry toward the wall, eager to keep their holy appointment. The fur-trimmed hats, the long black coats, the bobbing side curls are right out of the Middle Ages, preserving the strict tradition of life in the European ghettos. Jerusalem has always been a heady mixture of human and holy. Perhaps such moments come closest to touching the heart of Jerusalem. For despite its monumental past, Jerusalem exists for the future. And in God's city, where he was once very near, men still reach out to find him. The prophet Isaiah said, Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all nations. 
and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. As cool as wine, the wind is sighing through silent mountain pines. The evening light is slowly dying as bells of evening chime. So many songs, so many stories, the rocks and hills recall. Within your heart, inside the city, the ancient stones, the wall. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, forever young, yet forever old. My heart will sing your song of glory, Jerusalem. Saturday at sundown, the Sabbath officially ends, and Saturday night, the whole country lets off steam. If you live in Tel Aviv and you can walk, crawl, or get someone to push you along, you head for Dizengoff Street. Tired of jostling in the parade, you may be lucky enough to find a seat and watch everyone else get tired. For those brief hours, Israel reflects the very personal joy of just being alive. Perhaps you have to live here to understand what that means. Here's a definition of prophecy for you. It is history that has been written down before it's happened. Hey, that's beautiful. And it really fits. You know, just as Ezekiel prophesied that Israel would one day return to this land, so Micah foretold exactly where Christ would be born. But from you, O Bethlehem, shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth is from old, from ancient days. You know, it really amazes me that Micah should know all of that 700 years before the shepherds first came to find him. All the wise men followed that star. 
Well, Isaiah lived about the time Micah did, and he prophesied the Messiah's name, his family background, his virgin birth, where he would live, his ministry here on this earth, and how he would die. In fact, Cliff, every main event of Jesus' life was plainly foretold by the prophets of Israel. You know, Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. And it's really fitting that Jesus, the bread of life for the whole world, should have been born here. Is it true that most of the people in Bethlehem are Christian Arabs? Almost everybody attends one of the town's many churches. Churches, Jesus continually stressed the fact that God doesn't acknowledge the barriers that men put up. He looks straight through to the heart. That means that God really has a plan for the Arab countries as well as Israel. In the book of Genesis, God told both the father and the mother of the Arab nation that he would make of them a great nation. And the prophet Isaiah even gives us more detail. And in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Hey, looks like we've got company. Hi there. Marahaba. Hey, would you like some candy? Yeah, what's your name, pal? Here's one for you. Oh, come on, girls. Come here, would you like some candy? Bethlehem. Over here, girl. Here one clear and shivering night. All of the stars were out, but one was especially bright, for it was shining down over that little town where baby Jesus lay there on a bed of day. Jesus came to love us like we are right now. Glad or sad, good or bad, tall and wide. Out your side. He can love us anyhow. Stars still shine above. Children still laugh and play. Protected by the Savior's Flying north to Galilee, Cliff was the first to spot Mount Tabor rising like a sentinel above the green valleys, guarding the entrance to Galilee country. Ancient Nazareth is all but lost in the new industrial city. But from this height, you are even more aware of the surrounding countryside where Jesus must have played as a boy and hurried through as a man when he turned his back on Nazareth. Thinking about Jesus covering the same distance on foot that we are flying over at something like 100 miles an hour, well, physically, he must have been quite a man. There are just no words for that first glimpse of the Sea of Galilee. So much of the New Testament was lived along these shores. Bustling cities that once rimmed the sea have crumbled with the centuries. But the truth that Jesus taught here is still good news to a world that now touches the moon. Night drops like a blanket over Galilee, and Israeli folk songs echo across the stillness of the lake. <laughs> <laughs> In 
in the stars his handiwork I see on the wind he speaks with majesty though he ruleth over land and sea what is that to me I will celebrate nativity for it has a place in history sure he came to set his people free what is that to me till by faith I met him face to face and I felt the wonder of his grace then I knew that he was more than just a God who didn't care that lived away out there and now he walks beside me day by day ever watching on me lest I stray helping me to find that narrow way he's everything to me Galilee still has its fishermen at dawn they converge on the tiny harbor at Tiberius after a long night's work on the sea spilling out their catch on the docks, hoping for a good price from the local merchants. These thick-skinned sons of the sea are rough, burly, short-tempered, intensely human. Not the stuff saints are supposed to be made of, but they were. That's what makes the Bible so real, if we would just read between the lines. My thoughts went to some other young men who had worked these waters all night without a catch. Fishermen by trade, they were just as spiky as this lot. They had hurried back to Galilee after Jesus' resurrection. It was Peter's idea to take the boat out. Work helps a man to think things through, and they had plenty to think about. So out there on the lake, they wrestled with their nets and came up empty. And then, as John tells it, just as dawn streaked the sea with light, a man hailed them from the shore with, Any fish, boys? No, we replied. Then he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get plenty of them. So we did, and couldn't draw in the net because of the weight of the fish. There were so many. Then I said to Peter, It is the Lord. At that, Simon Peter jumped into the water and swam ashore. The rest of us stayed in the boat and dragged the loaded net to shore about 300 feet away. When we got there, we saw that a fire was kindled and fish were frying over it and there was bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went out and dragged the net ashore. By his count, there were 153 large fish and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And none of us dared ask him if he really was the Lord, for we were quite sure of it. Almost 20 centuries ago, these hills and the glistening sea were witness to the parables and the miracles, the touch of Jesus. At that moment, Cliff and I just wanted to thank him for finding us along the way. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. He lets me rest in meadows green, and he leads me beside the quiet stream. He keeps on giving life to me, and he helps me to do what honors him the most. And even when walking through the dark valley of death, the valley of death, I will never be afraid, for he is close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. 
He spreads a feast before me In the presence of my enemies He welcomes me as his special guest With a blessing visit to Israel would be complete without climbing the Mount of Olives. A lot of the Bible happened right here on this mountain. And a lot more will happen. You mean when Jesus comes back? That's when God is really going to change this world. He started dropping hints about it way back in the Old Testament. Seems like all the prophets had something to say. This is from Zechariah. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Zechariah laid all that out 550 years before Christ was even born. That makes this mountain more strategic than any space center anywhere. When he is going to come back is still God's mystery. But the fact that he is coming has been clearly spelled out. There's no more hinting around when you get to the New Testament. It's specifically mentioned over 300 times. I like the way that Jesus put it that night when he had that last meal with the disciples where they shared the bread and the wine. Judas had left and, well, the others must have been uneasy because Jesus looked around and he said, you must not let yourselves be distressed. You must hold on to your faith in God and to your faith in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If there were not, should I have told you that I am going away to prepare a place for you? It is true that I am going away to prepare a place for you. But it is just as true that I am coming again to welcome you into my own home so that you may be where I am. And when he comes, the whole world will know. The ascension must have happened somewhere around here. Let's see. It was just 40 days after the resurrection. Jesus had shown himself a number of times to his disciples in human form during that 40 days to convince them that he was far from dead. And he talked to them about what was going to happen next and even appeared to them at Galilee. Now on that last day when they were all together in Jerusalem, Jesus brought them up here on this mountain to tell them goodbye. You know, when Jesus first came into the world, he didn't have much of a fanfare. I mean, well, there was the star, but not many people knew who he was. And then again, when he left, just a handful of people saw him go. And at that very moment, one of the disciples asked, Lord, are you going to free Israel now from Rome and restore us as an independent nation? The Father sets those dates, he replied. They are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power to preach with great effect about my death and resurrection to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It was not long afterwards that he rose into the sky and disappeared into a cloud, leaving them staring after him. As they were straining their eyes for another glimpse, Suddenly, two white-robed men were standing there among them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has gone away to heaven, and someday, just as he went, so he will return. 
There was great power in Christ's death and resurrection, power that changed people's lives. You see, the cross is the pivotal point of history. And when Christ died there nearly 2,000 years ago, it was all according to God's plan. The perfection of his life and his love was poured out on that cross for our sins, the imperfection of you and me. That's what the Bible means when it says Christ died for our sin. He literally poured out his blood for us. And it was on the cross that the judgment and penalty of your sin and mine was paid. For the scripture makes it plain that everyone who ever lived will stand before God and give an account of his life. To those who are outside of Christ, who have never received him as their personal savior, it will be eternal separation from God. Now you can believe all this or not believe it. God puts no pressure on anyone, but he does give you a will so that you can make your own choice. His future plan for the world is here. Some of it is clearly spelled out. Some of it is only suggested. But he will do what this book says. If you had an hour's warning that Jesus Christ was about to return, what would you feel? What would you do? Would you welcome him as your Lord and Savior? Or would he be a stranger, some vague figure from history? Maybe you've had doubts about him all your life. There's one man in the Bible who really wanted to believe but couldn't shake his doubt. And he looked Jesus right in the eye and said, help me with my unbelief. God really deals with honesty like that. Is your life what he wants it to be? What you know it should be as a Christian? Many people have lost sight of the fact that Jesus Christ will return to this planet. And in spite of man's incredible achievements in this century, God has still reserved the final chapter of history for himself. It's all here in this book. And after experiencing this film, I hope you will have a fresh awareness that what God begins, he finishes. Well, I wanted you to see this film, and I wanted you to understand and to know the scriptures as what God has to say concerning uh, this land and his promises. You see, the Bible is true cover to cover. I believe every word of it. And God of all the nations of this earth chose the Jewish people to give this land as an inheritance. So thank you for watching. Thank you for taking your time to see this. I've been in Israel over 40 times and we've had many friends in this country, both Palestinian and Jew and Christian. And so we pray for Israel. The Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I hope you will join me in praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you for watching. God bless you.